In terms of who I am, you know, as a clinical psychologist, um, you know, I have a wide variety of practice. I'm in, you know, working with kids, I work with adults, and uh, do cons consultation in schools. Um, but in the course of all my work, what I got into, sort of found my way into, was looking at neuroscience and thinking, how does all that stuff in the brain, the, all the information that comes out on Newsweek and, <coughs> excuse me, um, and all the information that, that's in the neuroscience books, and it's the, in the brain and behavior book that you may have gotten uh, in your training, how, how can I use that in the therapy that I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis with my clients? So it's, this isn't a, a, a lecture on how does neuropsychology talk about brain damage and, and then what does that mean? This is how in the course of your regular therapy interventions, your interactions with kids, I gave a talk two days ago, how do you parent your middle school child's brain? Um, you know, so how does day-to-day -day stuff happen that we can use neuroscience to guide us and, and consider what we're doing. So that's the point of what I'm doing. Um, in my experience, you know, I start talking about neuroscience with a clinician and pretty soon they're asleep. Um, and my goal is to be a bridge person who can take the ideas of neuroscience and make it relevant so that then you can go out and use it rather than use it like as, as one friend of mine said, to fall asleep. Okay, so what are we gonna be trying to accomplish today? I'll be presenting concepts regarding brain functioning. Um, again, I view myself as a bridge person. There's all this neuropsychology information out there, there's neuroscience information. I'm bridged to try to get it into your clinical office. That's my goal, my goal is, is, is to help that happen. Um, so present concepts of brain functioning, identify how specific concepts fit into the psychotherapy process, um, you know, and then uh, look at and give you examples of how I apply that just in my day-to-day -day interactions with the clients that I see and, and in the evaluations I do. Now right here, we have a picture of my brain. Um, I colored it myself. You know, I learned from motor behavior as well as, you know, learning with words. Um, but you may notice that it doesn't seem quite complicated enough. So, so therefore, I have to do this. Um, warning, this, this lecture may be hazardous to your scientific health. Um, the point is, this is not a brain that you're, you want your neurosurgeon to be using before he goes inside to do some work. Um, this, this gives you concepts and ideas that hopefully relate neuroscience, relate neuropsychological ideas, and help you bring it into focus in your work and in your thinking about the people with whom you work. So, um, and you know, you can get your information a lot of places, like, you know, down here is, somewhere down in here is the medulla oblongata, and if you remember your Adam Sandler water boy, that's the seat of rage. No, it's not. Okay, so depending on where you pick up your information, you, you just have to be careful, but it's a, it's a simplified way of looking at what's going on with a person. But it guides me. When I'm looking at, when I'm working with a person, I'm working with my borderline client, um, she tends to get too emotional too fast, but on the other hand, sometimes she's lost and doesn't know where, you know, where stuff is coming from and why is she reacting the way she's reacting. If we're lost and I'm trying to figure out how it's connected, I'm gonna move down from here, down into the emotional centers, down toward the lower part of the brain just to try to explore what are the connections and where's it going. But now it's 15 minutes before the end of the session and this person's gonna go out and be walking on the streets and we start moving up here and I start to ask it, well, what do you think about that? Or what, what, how does that fit with your idea of what's happened? And now we're starting to talk about uh, cognitive stuff and we're starting to talk about thoughts and ideas and, and we're going away from the emotion. And so as I'm thinking of my brain here, I'm moving around in the brain, depending on what we're trying to do in different phases of the, of the therapy session at the moment. And so I use it that way. So it offers me a framework and a map. So what's the value of, of doing the brain? Um, it helps me when I'm thinking about assessment and diagnosis. I have a behavior problem kid in the, in, in the school and I'm going in to consult. And so he gets out of control, he does things he's not supposed to do. But the questions would be, is it because his attention and impulse control in the front of his brain isn't working? So he has a regular old reaction to something that's regular old happening, but he doesn't control it all, so it's all over the place. Well, that's an impulse control problem. That's a stop and think problem. 
is it a bipolar problem? He's right here, and every time he has the smallest reaction to anything, all of a sudden his whole brain is exploding, and that's what's driving him to come back, you know, to be all over the place behaviorally. Or is it more of a basic arousal problem? It's not so much emotion. He gets worked up about anything. And we'll talk about some of those kids and, and what happens to them. But when I'm thinking, what's going on? I'm thinking, where in the brain is it happening? Because that's going to guide me into what I'm going to do in my interventions. So it changes my thoughts about assessment and diagnosis. The decisions regarding intervention change. One of the ones that I noticed changing as I went through my neuroscience exploration was what I would suggest regarding an ADHD kid. You know, early on, you know, I'm a psychologist. Let's do behavior management. He's big enough that you can still stick him under your arm and carry him somewhere if he's misbehaving. So let's not do the meds. You know, let's avoid meds as long as we can. But then as I went through my neuroscience training, the, and, and in integrating that, it became clear, I, this kid needs to have different parts of his brain firing together. They need to fire over and over again to learn the patterns of attachment, to learn the patterns of learning behavioral self-management, and if they're not firing over and over again in a consistent way, even at a young age, he's going to miss important aspects of development. Well, then maybe we need to have this kid on medication, because if his attention is going here, 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 even if he has all the wires and genetic potential waiting for it to happen, it's not happening, his development will be disrupted by that. And that would change what I would want to do for an intervention there. Um, you, know, it, you know, it changes my, my decisions regarding interventions, like with the borderline person. Do I want to do mindfulness, self-control kinds of things? because their emotions are out of control and we want to help them bring that back under control. And we know that if we move your thinking, if we move your focus up here and you start to label the emotions you're having, the intensity of your emotion goes down. All right? On the other hand, if we're lost and we don't know what is causing and triggering the person, one of the worst questions that I know of is why. Um, and, so I, but, and so I don't want him to be up here. I want him to come back down here, and I want him to tell me what. What happened? What was it like? Describe it to me in detail, and then we can start to get in touch. So depending on which part of the brain uh, I think is going on guides my thoughts in terms of where I'm going to go in terms of my intervention. It changes my interventions with my clients. Talking with my bipolar kid, and he feels like he's just more, more sort of like a basket of trash, you know, because look what he's done to the room five times at school, and, and he is bad to his mom, and, and he can't ever control himself, so he's mostly worthless. But then if I can take him into my office, and I have a thing about the end of my pinky, and I say right there, that's your amygdala, and that's a, that's a bad thing that your amygdala gets out of control. You're a bipolar disorder kid. Okay, but look at all the rest of your brain. You know the part that makes you feel so bad afterwards where you're thinking, I wish I didn't do that? Well, that's this part up here, okay? And you know all the good things you can remember that you did and that you would like to do in the future, and it's your vision back here, and it's your hearing out here. Those are all the parts of the, your brain that want to do things right. So it's not all of you. There's this part that's not working. Let's work together to help make it better, okay? Instead of, you know what? You're a chemical mess, all right? Um, and so... Uh, you, have chem you have a chemical imbalance was better than your morally evil, okay, but it didn't give you much specificity, so it's a global kind of thing, and what we're doing here is trying to take it, there's a piece that's not working. And then the last thing is when I start using the brain and my thinking of what's going on for people, it changes my intuition, okay. When I first started, you know, I was thinking, well, here I'm a clinician, and I really like that feeling kind of stuff, and I like empathizing with my clients, and I thought, I'm going to start doing this, this neuroscience stuff, and I'm going to lose touch, and I'm going to get cold, and I'm going to get clinical, and I'm going to get removed, and, and I was worried about that. But as I went through it, I found actually the opposite happened. All right, so, so if I'm working with uh, my PTSD, abused as a child, you know, patient, and she loses it in the office, and she doesn't even know, she can't even see me in the office, and at the end of a dissociative episode, she's feeling crazy, okay? But if I can, I, I had the feeling, okay, I know that the parts of her brain that were having vision were being taken over by her 
you know, cap encapsulated memory networks related to her abuse so that she couldn't see me because those networks were being used to envision the perpetrator. It's not a crazy thing, it's just the fact that that was an encapsulated, dissociated event and you can't see two things at once in your vision system. Oh, okay, that's what was happening. Now I'm not so crazy. Now there's an, an explanation for what happened and, there, and then if you can get rid of the crazy, then they can be, be able to settle down and start working and start um, uh, moving towards something better. And so those, that kind of shift in my thinking that comes with thinking in neuroscience terms has, what, has given me what feels like better empathy and better a sense of, oh, this is what it must feel like in that situation. So it's another one of my sophisticated uh, diagrams. Um, I just, I gotta think, I gotta think easy because if it gets beyond this, you know, I, I get lost, so. Um, but, but I use that as my strength. You know, you gotta use your strength, your weaknesses as your strength because I can't get the conceptualizations much bigger and maintain an idea. Then I keep it so that I can explain it to other people too. And that's, so that's the goal here. This is, for lack of a better word, the big picture. And what this does is it takes some of what we have over here in my simple brain onto this simple diagram. So we have executive functioning like decision making and we have attention that's down here and we have sensory processing that would be the different sensory systems. And so what I've done is laid them out so that we can then more easily look at which things are working, okay? And then the way it would look is where is it coming from? Which systems is it affecting? And then which systems am I gonna work on to try to make change happen? And I'll be using this as we go through to try to keep us oriented uh, to the different things that I'm looking at. Uh, the example might be, if I'm working on a, pro a problem of sexual abuse history, then they've got a pattern of going through relationships, but then relationships are violated by sexual contact, and so that's an old pattern that's there for them. Um, but at this point, maybe the process that we're working with maybe is anxiety because every time they get close to a relationship, they get so anxious that they're not being able to get involved with the relationship. And so I'm not working on relationships yet. We're just working on managing the anxiety and how am I doing it? I'm going to try to get them to use the front of their head, their executive functioning, to choose to confront some of the anxiety, to choose to learn you know, re uh, you know, uh, relaxation skills and then we'll choose to do some different focus in approaching the issues later. But at this moment where I'm intervening is up here in the front and then choosing some motor behaviors, learning relaxation skills to help this person slowly move forward. So again, the, the big picture that just thinking about it in those kind of terms keeps me oriented and keeps me thinking of what's going on. So when I think of what's happening in the brain, I break it up into these three, three sort of ways of looking at the brain. The first is the brain operates in a, in a pieces and steps or input process output way. Okay, information comes in, it gets processed in the brain, and it comes back out in some kind of behavior or some kind of thought or reaction. And, and each one of those things occurs somewhere in the brain. So input will come in through the sensory system, output will go out through the motor system, it'll get processed in the vision system and in the auditory system, and then it'll go sent up to um, an integration system. And so input process output looks at different things are happening both in, a, in parallel, one after the other, but in series, in different places, but they tend to then get together and, and spread out in terms of how they go through the brain. Now the other way of looking at it is the combinations way of looking at it, and that means every experience we have has elements all over the brain, okay? So on, and so if I, one, one of the ones I always like is, you know, when it hits September, and now the sun is down wherever it gets down to in, in the fall, and the light turns sort of golden, then I always start thinking of Florida State University in the fall, my girlfriend at college, and it's all back. You know, it's like, and so, and it has vision, and it has, you know, feeling of the temperature, and it has um, remembrances then of the things we did, and so it's, it's a vision thing, it's a, a sensory thing, it's a, an attachment thing, I was close to her, I, I, emotional kinds of things. Um, 
thinking about the sorry decisions I was making. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, the, but those things, and, and that's all the, the network occurring all over the place. And then the last piece that, that we'll be looking at in terms of our major concepts is development. I, the, the most obvious that I think that people think about it is, of course, a five-year-old you know, processes information differently than a 30-year-old, so you have to talk to them in a more, it's more simplistically and, and do things more in a concrete kind of way. And that, I think that's the most obvious. But the things that the, the thinking about the brain does is when you're talking to the 30-year-old about something that happened when he's five years old, guess what? His experience is not a 30-year-old experience. And so when that 30-year-old starts to remember his father beating him at age five, he's looking up. Why is a 30-year-old looking up? Part of his memory of the event is re-experiencing it. His brain is having the event, which is part of the memory. Well, now why don't you behave like a 30-year-old and put it aside and put it behind you because that's not what's happening anymore. But that's not what's going on. Part of the, me the memory uses the whole brain just like the experience used the whole brain. And so then we have to help them deal with that. Um, and so we have to help them process feeling like a five-year-old, which is not what they want to be feeling. But then the next thing, there is an advantage to that. You know, this 30-year-old is going back through a five-year-old experience and can then reinterpret this five-year-old film that's running through his head and begin to see it in a different kind of way. And so on the one hand, it's demoralizing to feel like you're five when you're 30, but on the other hand, this 30-year-old gets a chance to redo it because they can re-experience it in a very clear way. So, uh, so but that's just ways to be thinking about with development. Uh, if we consider development, how does that change things? So we'll start looking at the first part, you know, go into some of the details first. It's the neuropsychological model, it's input, process, output. So what is neuropsychology? Neuropsychology developed when they were trying to figure out what happened to the brain and how are we, especially like um, related to war, war is a good place to learn lots of things. So people would have head injuries, there would be pieces of things flying through their brain. And when they were trying to figure out where is it and what's going on, what they figured out was, if you can, different sets of behaviors get run by different parts of the brain. And so you can give somebody different tasks to do, and you know this task requires um, right side vision, this task requires left side vision, this task requires attention, this task doesn't require attention, this task is verbal, this task is nonverbal. And so they would give a series of tasks, and in the course of giving the task, they could figure, oh, you know what? That bullet is probably lodged down in the back right side of the brain, and that's where the surgeon's gonna go work on it. Well, you don't need to do that anymore. You got an MRI. <laughs> There's the bullet, and hopefully they're going in on the right side. You know, they now write on the right side of your brain. You know, this is where we're going in, because the doctors don't want to make those mistakes somebody paid for. Um, but, <coughs> sorry. Um, but, so, so the way it would work is if I gave a kid a, you know, a couple of drawings to do in the morning and I gave him a list of words to remember and then in the afternoon I said, can you do those drawings again? And oh my God, he does the same drawing exactly like it was before. And can you tell me what those words were? And he says, what words? Oh, okay, so we don't have a general memory problem because he can pull up the old vision, the old images that he had, but his words aren't working for the flip. There's something happened on the, probably on the left side of the brain, probably in the verbal processing system, but, and maybe a memory system on that side, but it's not a global memory system, and so then we start to look at the details of what's going on. So that's just an example of, of how it can work. <clears throat> 